Number 6. P-47 There are a few reports of captured P-47 Thunderbolt aircrafts being used by the German Air Force. One operated by U.S. 2nd Lieutenant William E. Roach made an emergency landing on a German airfield on November 7, 1943. The pilot was taken prisoner and the Thunderbolt was given the German markings T-9LK, likely for reconnaissance over England prior to D-Day. The Americans seized it when they took over the airport where it was being kept. At least two other captured P-47s were used by the Germans as well for reconnaissance, testing, and propaganda. Number 5. 1999 F-117A Shootdown on March 27, 1999, the Army of Yugoslavia's 3rd Battalion of the 250th Air Defense Missile Brigade, led by Colonel Zoltan Dani, shot down an F-117A aircraft during the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. The pilot ejected and was recovered by rescue crews. This was the only incident in which an F-117 was taken down. The United States Air Force designed the aircraft in the 1970s, entered service in 1983, and was publicly unveiled in 1988. It was widely regarded as one of the most sophisticated pieces of U.S. military weaponry when it first saw battle over Panama in 1989. Yugoslavian air defenses were viewed at the time as being mostly out of date. Several missiles were launched at around 8.15 p.m. local time with a range of approximately 8 miles. According to Sergeant Dragon Matic, the soldier who fired the missiles detected the F-117 at a range of roughly 31 to 37 miles, operating their equipment for no more than 17 seconds to prevent being locked on by NATO anti-air suppression. In a 2007 interview, Donnie stated that his forces noticed the aircraft on radar when its bomb bay doors opened, boosting its radar signal. Lieutenant Colonel Dale Zelko, a veteran of Operation Desert Storm, piloted the F-117. He saw the launch of two missiles and their approach to his plane. The first one passed close enough to create buffeting, but didn't detonate. The second missile, on the other hand, did detonate, causing substantial damage to the aircraft and forcing it to spiral out of control. As the airplane plummeted, Zelko was subjected to high G-forces and struggled to assume the proper ejection stance. He utilized his survival radio to transmit a mayday call when his parachute released and was able to reach a KC-135 that had witnessed him shot down. Zelko used his survival radio while still descending, reasoning that the altitude would provide the best potential range for his transmission. He was certain he would be apprehended by Serbian forces on the ground and wanted to ensure he was unharmed before they got to him. Zelko landed in a field south of Ruma and quickly hid in a drainage ditch. There, he experienced the shockwaves caused by American bombs dropped by B-2 bombers on targets near Belgrade. Despite a huge search conducted in the region by the Serbian army, police, and local residents, he remained unnoticed. The next morning, he was recovered by a combat search and rescue team from the United States Air Force. A second F-117A supposedly suffered damage during the same mission on April 30th, and although it made it back to base, it never flew again, according to sources. On May 2, 1999, the 250th Air Defense Missile Brigade also shot down a USAF F-16 fighter. These were the only two victories out of dozens of ground-to-air missiles fired throughout the conflict. Some F-117 debris has been kept at the Serbian Museum of Aviation in Belgrade, while other components have been shipped to Russia for use in developing anti-stealth technology. The F-117 was decommissioned by the United States Air Force in 2008. Number 4. USSR Captured American Aircraft During the Korean War of the early 1950s, the Soviet MiG-15 and American F-86 Sabre fighter jets were essentially on par with each other. Both sides attempted to seize one another's planes, but only the USSR succeeded. In April 1951, Lieutenant Colonel Zhubenko led a crew of test pilots to North Korea. Their mission was to force land an F-86 at a North Korean airport. The group's operation was a failure, and the Sabre was quickly captured by the Soviets. On October 6 the same year, Soviet pilot Lt. Col. Yegevany Pepelev caused such precise damage to an American jet that it landed on the North Korean shore almost unharmed. The U.S. pilot was apprehended by a U.S. Air Force search and rescue team, but the plane was confiscated and sent to Moscow. The Soviet Union decided to replicate the killer of MiGs as the F-86 was dubbed in the Western press. Stalin gave a year to the designer Vladimir Kondratev to develop a Soviet saber. However, Kondratev failed in his duty and the project was abandoned following Stalin's death. In the end, it was agreed to borrow individual captured fighter units, components, and materials for use in the Soviet aircraft business. To capture a MiG-15, the Americans launched Operation Moolah on November 1, 1950, promising a substantial prize to North Korean pilots who defected to South Korea aboard functional planes. However, the procedure failed. On September 21, 1953, after the war had already ended, defector No Kum Sok landed a MiG-15 at the Kimpo Air Base near Seoul. 
Six of the United States' newest F-11 aardvark jet bombers arrived in Vietnam on March 17, 1968. The North Vietnamese called this aircraft Whispering Death due to its ability to approach unexpectedly and near silently, attack quickly, and vanish without a trace. The aardvark was first seen by Soviet intelligence personnel during the Paris Air Show in Le Bourget in the spring of 1967. Even though it was under the close supervision of U.S. military police, Soviet operatives managed to take many pictures of it from different perspectives. The most difficult and vital work, however, had still to be completed, researching the aircraft's insides. In truth, the Whispering Death was not as frightening as it appeared. Only a few weeks after their arrival in Vietnam, two aardvark aircrafts were shot down by the Vietnamese People's Army's air defense troops, while another was seized and delivered to the Soviet Union. There are various stories of how the aardvark was captured. According to one of them, the F-111 was drowned out. In other words, its communications with its base were disrupted, while a Soviet pilot in a fighter jet pushed the U.S. plane to the ground and forced it to land at an airstrip in North Vietnam. Others, however, disagree that the Soviet Union had the technological capability to jam the radio signals of a U.S. airliner. According to this view, the pilots were simply paid and cut off connections with their base. Overall, the Soviet Union gained a lot of trophies from the Vietnam War. Not only did they obtain the F-111, but Moscow also obtained an F-4, an A-37, and an F-5E aircraft, CH-47A Chinook helicopters, an AIM-7 Sparrow missile, and hundreds of other pieces of American military gear. Number 3. FW-190 On June 1, 1939, the prototype FW-190 Verger aircraft went into service. The nimble and fast aircraft soon impressed Luftwaffe leaders, and by the late 1940s they were visible on the front lines, though they did not participate in combat missions until August 1941. However, engine dependability concerns caused by overheating plagued FW-190 aircraft until the arrival of BMW engines in the spring of 1942. They were seriously evaluated for ground assault duties once the engine dependability issue was rectified. Because there were no liquid cooling systems that may be damaged in battle, the German army thought they were an excellent contender for close ground support. The BMW radial engines were air-cooled. The strong and large undercarriage also made them excellent for landing and taking off from frontline airfields. When the British first faced FW-190 fighters, they had no clue they were dealing with a new type of aircraft. The British pilots mistook captured French fighters for hostile German aircraft, although the superior performance of the hostile German aircraft ultimately raised some concerns. The British were planning a commando-style attack to capture a Fock Wolf 190 aircraft from a French base, eager to acquire the secrets of the new Luftwaffe's fighter. They were saved the hassle when a disoriented German pilot from 111 JG2 mistakenly landed his FW 190A3 fighter at RAF Pembry in South Wales, UK, thinking it was an airfield in France. The captured aircraft was sent to the Air Fighting Development Unit at Duxford, England, where it was determined during trials that the FW-190A was better in all areas except turning circle than the Spitfire VB, which was then used by the majority of RAF Fighter Command. Only after that, the British learned the Germans could outclass the ponderous Spitfire fighters with the FW-190. Germany provided Japan with a few FW-190 fighter of the A-8 version for technical examination. The findings of the Japanese engineers' investigation were integrated into the design of the KI-61 fighter. During the war, a total of 20,051 were supplied. Number 2. The Spitfire The Spitfire MKVB registration EN-830 was one of the 12,129 Spitfires produced at Castle Bromwich. It was equipped with a Rolls-Royce Merlin 45 engine, which gave the aircraft a top speed of 375 miles per hour, a range of 470 miles, a service ceiling of 35,000 feet, and heavy artillery of two 20mm cannons and four 0.303-inch machine guns. The aircraft made its first flight on April 30, 1942, and was turned over to the No. 37 Maintenance Unit at RAF Burtonwood the following month on May 1, 1942. In early June 1942, he joined No. 131 Squadron and was assigned the Squadron Code NXX. At the time, they were situated at RAF Merston and were conducting offensive operations over northern France. On August 25, 1942, it was involved in a flying mishap, which caused the aircraft to be grounded for a long period of time. The weather that day delivered heavy overcast and poor visibility, excellent conditions for Fighter Command to launch rhubarb missions from RAF Westhampton, where No. 131 Squadron was based. A section of fighters and bombers flew over the English Channel, then flew beneath the clouds in search of targets of opportunity. The No. 131 squadron would fly two rhubarbs, the first which would be flown by Pilot Officer Bernard Schildhauer in a Spitfire MKVB and Pilot Officer Henry de Bordas of the Free French Air Force. After taking off at 2.10 p.m. and flying over the water to France, they arrived at St. Aubin-sur-Mer Cannes before flying to Carentan, Normandy, where Pilot Officer Schildhauer attacked and destroyed a train. 
Pilot Officer DeBordis had been separated from Pilot Officer Shieldhauer, whose aircraft had been struck by flak. He couldn't find him despite radio calls and circling the area. As he flew west, Pilot Officer Shieldhauer was forced to land in a field on what he assumed was the Isle of Wight, but was really occupied by Jersey. Captured by the Germans and imprisoned in Stalag Luft III, he would participate in the Great Escape alongside squadron leader Roger Bushall. They were killed by the Gestapo four days after they escaped, along with 48 other escapees. Bernard Schildhauer, a pilot officer, was born on August 18, 1921 and died on March 30, 1944. He was only 22 years old at the time. Despite the crash landing, the plane was still airworthy and was flown to the Luftwaffe's primary test airfield in Reschland, Germany, within a month of being captured. The code CJZY would be assigned to it and it would be painted yellow and green. The Spitfire's 12-volt electrical system was replaced with the Luftwaffe's 24-volt system, its armament was removed, and its Rolls-Royce Merlin 45 engine was replaced with a Daimler-Benz DB605A engine. It was later sent to Echterdingen, Germany, where it was equipped with a propeller and a carburetor scoop from a Merschmitt BF109G. Because the BF109G used the same Daimler-Benz engine, comparative tests were conducted between both aircraft. Number 1. MiG-25 Foxbat Despite being a skilled fighter pilot in one of the Soviet Union's finest squadrons with all the benefits that came with it, Viktor Belenko was sick of the shortages and propaganda that characterized most of life in the USSR. He was concerned that stories of abundance in the United States were likewise overstated, but he decided to take a risk. On September 6, 1976, on a regular training operation, he turned off his radio and flew to Japan's Hokodate Airport. He landed in Japan with only a shattered landing gear after nearly running out of fuel, narrowly missing a civilian aircraft and overshooting the runway. It turned out to be one of the great Cold War intelligence coups. Western spy services began to disassemble the aircraft, examining the fighter whose capabilities had previously been assumed. Afterward, on September 25, 1976, a U.S. Air Force C-5 Galaxy cargo plane flew the plane from Hokodate to Hayukari Air Force Base, and by then, Analysts had concluded that the plane was an interceptor, not a fighter bomber, which provided great relief to Japanese defense strategists. When the Soviet Union sought its return, Japan agreed to return it only on the condition that the transport costs be reimbursed. The plane arrived in dozens of containers aboard a parked Soviet warship, and when the Soviets found at least 20 vital components were missing, they requested $10 million in compensation. Neither paid, which was rather becoming for the Cold War. The Soviet Air Force suffered severe losses as a result of his defection. Belenko was given refuge by U.S. President Gerald Ford, and a trust fund was established for him, allowing him to live well in later years. After his defection, the U.S. government debriefed him for five months and hired him as a consultant for several years. Belenko had carried the MiG-25 pilot's manual with him, expecting to aid U.S. pilots in examining and testing the aircraft. The MiG-25 Foxbat was the Soviet Union's most recent and sophisticated fighter. The United States and its NATO allies were legitimately concerned about its capabilities, and it was widely considered to be a sophisticated fighter bomber capable of outflying anything NATO possessed. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The MiG-25 was innovative in its own right. It was one of the fastest fighters ever built, with a potential peak speed of Mach 3.2 at the risk of engine damage, placing it on par with the legendary SR-71 espionage plane from the U.S. It had one of the most powerful radars ever installed on a plane of its size. However, the MiG-25 was developed primarily to intercept U.S. high-altitude surveillance aircraft within Soviet territory. It couldn't carry ground attack weapons, didn't have an integrated cannon, and the huge wings that NATO understood as making it a deadly dogfighter were only needed to keep its hefty airframe aloft. In truth, it was nimble and, once close to short range, would be dead meat in traditional combat. Even though the plane had shortcomings, the Soviet Union produced over a thousand of them, and they were extensively exported to a number of nations, where their combat record in multiple wars was at best mediocre. Later, an improved version known as the MiG-31 was constructed that had many similarities with the original, including many of its flaws. Thanks for watching. Do you think any of these captures could have been avoided? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another video right here on American Eye.